Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dr. Music Podcast once again. Uh, I'd like to give a special thank you to the subscribers to the channel. Your kindness provides the opportunity to have talented guests like the gentleman I have with me today. He is the original bass player for classic rock band Journey, which is one of the best-selling bands of all time, having sold more than, I can't even say it, a hundred million albums. Uh, it's just insane. Uh, he has been inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He has a star on Hollywood Boulevard, and he has a stunning new debut solo album. Uh, it's called All of the Above. He's here to tell us about it. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ross Valerie. Ross, thank you so much. That's good to know. It's a wrap. Thank you. See you later. <laughs> Thank you for that introduction. Wow. It's wow. Uh, it's crazy. A hundred million albums. Uh, do, you, do you ever really grasp that? <laughs> I do. I do grasp that, you know. But, you know, everybody uh, in this day and age can count to a hundred million, but it's still pretty large. Anyhow, I've been blessed with a, a very long career uh, o over the better part of 48, 49 years, uh, encompassing most of my life. And I am very thankful uh, for what I've been able to achieve with the other band members, current and past. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful to the uh, Journey fans and those that have supported us over the years. I am blessed. Yeah, and uh, you know, I don't know anybody that doesn't like the band Journey. Uh, you know, it's just such a such a likable band, and it was so much great music. Um, you know, I when I grew up with Journey, I grew up with the first three records. I have two older brothers; those were the ones that were sitting in front of the turntable. Uh, you know, the, the look into the future and and the first record and next, and you know, all of those songs uh, were my introduction to Journey. And I think about this record you have now, all of the above, and it's it it reminds me more of that period. I uh, you know it's <laughs> you know, and that's just great for me. I love that uh, because I love that period of journey. Um, not the most popular period of journey, of course, this but is very good. musical. Yeah, that is a very good point, in and, and and the correlation that you've drawn between. My music and early journey is is uh, is very timely. That that is part of the the narrative I continue to provide. As early journey was very experimental, mm -hmm. very I uh, eclectic. Uh, uh, we weren't concerned with song length and whether it would uh, meet the three and a half to four minute time limit for certain formats of radio and. Uh, not to say that we didn't do what we wanted to do as the band evolved, but it was certainly very experimental in the beginning. Uh, you did mention that it wasn't as popular, uh, but, you know, it did reach some good hallmarks. All three of those albums in their day reached what is called gold record level. And in those days, a gold record was having sold 500,000 hard copies of the album and uh, then the the rating for uh, gold and platinum albums changed later on to uh, gold became five hundred thousand dollars worth which is a lot less so uh, okay. we we reached the benchmark when gold was uh, a higher standard and so there was a significant amount of success with those albums but certainly not as as uh, significant as what followed but the relationship of, of the kind of music that journey was doing then and uh, the kind of writing i was contributing to those albums is uh, definitely similar to the very experimental <laughs> approach i've done with my album uh, it, it's just this record uh a journey, uh, <laughs> you know, pun intended. There, uh, that <laughs> time, <laughs> uh, it, it's just there's there's so much to absorb. Uh, you know, and I've listened to the record, you know, dozens of times now, and I still get something different at each time. Um, but tell me, you know, you're. I see you do this record, but I see you in Journey for you know almost fifty years. 
um, doing AOR radio friendly rock verse chorus verse. Uh, that's what Journey fans want. Um, you know, the, for for the most part, other than those first three records, it's it's rock radio rock stuff. Um, not a whole lot of surprise. Uh, not like this record. Uh, was there ever a feeling of you know why i guess the question is why the solo record that's so experimental now um did you ever feel like you were held back in those years of you know you have all this stuff and you weren't able to get it out that's a very good question in fact there's some other journalists on the internet so, oh yeah well this is that wasn't his cup of tea and you know no i was not held back at all um first of all my background in music since the the day I was born has been quite varied, all kinds of influences. And, and the experience I had with rock and roll and popular music prior to a journey uh, allowed me a, a completely open field to become uh, what I had with the majority of uh, Journey's life in popular music. Uh, the instrument I chose and, and it ended up playing early in, in high school is a bass guitar. Yep. That doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the music requires a virtuoso in, in having a bass guitar dominating the composition. My first endeavor, not only as a bass guitarist, but as a bass singer and as a bass clarinetist, these are supporting roles. So it's, it's an approach that I've been trained for on in many different kinds of music and on many instruments. So mm -hmm. it's a matter of being a, an accompanist, providing the solid foundation in rhythm and tonality. And so I didn't feel I was held back at all. In fact, uh, <laughs> there are so many songs that really open up and are close to jamming uh, with the, the vast journey repertoire. So, um, I approached uh, my work with Journey as, I, as a bassist, as I approached my own music here. Uh, you may hear in, in the songs from all of the above, on some occasions, on some songs, or at least on some sections, the bass guitar is tucked into the mix as another supportive instrument. So to me, uh, as it was with Journey and it is with this music, it's not about being the featured player and trying to elbow my way into the, the front of the stage. My whole endeavor here is composition. Uh, my main motive is everything I've done, and I'll explain later at some point why it took so long, but that's another. It, my whole endeavor here is to be composing, arranging, and producing uh, my material. And... The, the, the protocol is what does the song require? What does the song need? And that has been the same recipe with Journey. What does the song really need here? Yeah. And it could be a solid arrangement in that certain style. So, uh, yes, I play uh, uh, in some cases uh, some flashy and, uh, and solo parts on, on the bass or basses in these songs. But likewise, I'm also providing a supporting rhythm, supporting tonality, because that's what the song needs or that's what that certain section requires. Yeah, and I think that's a recipe for success uh, in any in any form of music. You you have, I think you have to play to the song. Uh, you know, even, even the most... Uh, jazz fusion-ish kind of, you know, hey, look what I can do. It's not appealing if it doesn't play to the song. Uh, if it work for the song. And there's so many great players out there that have been out for decades and are popping up by the dozen mm -hmm. on the internet. There's some amazing bass players. But, yeah. you know, what I learned quite a while ago, or at least I was – it, my approach was affirmed and, and and supported. I remember listening to Victor Wooten's first album. Wow. Okay. Now, wow. talk about amazing virtuosity. But Scott may remember that certain songs or even certain passages of the songs, he was underneath, regardless of what he was soloing over or whatever somebody else was doing, 
he was in there and he was playing the bass. He knew well the concept of what does the song need. And there's time for him to solo here or this particular is slapping in your face all the way through. But there's the perspective. There's the idea. What does the song need? Yeah. 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 Oh, totally. And, uh, you know, I, and I, I noticed that right away. Uh, the bass is in the mix. It's part of a band, uh, you know, and I wasn't sure what to expect. I would expect, you know, you're a, a, an expert musician. I, I expected that from you. But when I get this, I, you know, it's a solo record. You think maybe he wants to just people to hear him play hey look what i can do uh and that's why i think that's why i love the record so much if you told me this was a mark russo solo record i could believe that he's all over this record i mean he is it, you give him a platform to do his thing and with you doing your thing that's what makes this a beautiful record you know and, well, him and so many others you know it, that's a good point in if I could really expand on that in at least three clearly related areas. You could say it's a Mark Russo album because he's all over it. Now, um, a lot of the musicians I worked with, and in, in many cases, there were different combinations of music for musicians for particular songs because they were best suited for them. But Mark's on quite a few of the songs, mm -hmm. and you know he's the consummate player. And the consummate session guy, he does his homework, he comes in, what do you want, what do you need? And of course, uh, that certainly direction was provided for Mark. Here's where your solos are. Here's the melody, okay? Uh, here's where you you and Eric Levy on keyboards mm -hmm. uh, do a duet. And, and then here's your space to improvise. Play what you want to play. And so there, there, there was one phase was getting the, the players familiar with the music. But what I had immediately from all of these musicians was the essential thing. Despite their professionalism and their talent, they liked the music and yeah. inspired them. I'm going, wow. So once a person had met minimal requirements, uh, as, as Mark obviously did, I said, okay, uh, you know, we got room to do more takes. Or, do you feel right? You want to do another one for shits and giggles, or feel free to do that. And that's what the what what Mark did, and what several of the of the players did as well. But I I approached my music in, in, in at a, yet another level. It may not be anything new or original, but <laughs> once, once they were done with their parts i'd say okay what do you think what do you feel about it how would you possibly want to interpret this differently always gave them the leeway yeah. now there's another fine player in in that's all over the album as well carl Parazzo, yeah. master percussionist who's been with carlos santana for decades mm -hmm. carl was at the ground floor when i began approaching my first recording about uh, 10 years ago or so it was wild kingdom and i had brought carl in at that point and he understood that this is not pure latin but we both agreed that that what i created could be on a foundation of traditional latin rhythm so he could bring all of his cultural and musical experience and actually lay down the real deal and I had that to work with. So it's kind of like I was painting. I had a foundation of something uh, purist and familiar to uh, people who uh, listen to Latin music or play it. And I was able to paint over that. But uh, again, with Carl, he brought in uh, Walfredo Reyes, uh, played the drums on, amazing player, former Santa drummer. And it was like I was in the room with master players working on my song it's like <laughs> oh goodness but carl played has played and continued to play a a, a a a greater part at another level uh once uh percussion parts and drum parts for any given song that he was involved with were finished i'd bring him in after the recording session i say 
how would you want to hear this rendered? How would you, not, not to say that I and Eric and Jacob, our brilliant engineer, wouldn't have any idea, but I'm going, while you're here, instead of just saying, okay, I've done this session, it was great, <laughs> mm -hmm. stick around a while and offer your, your, your opinions as how you would want to hear yourself rather than you know getting the paycheck finishing the coffee and getting in your car how do you want to hear it and that not only was a, a flattering and honoring and and, and and a compliment to him it's like wow i've never done this before are you sure i'm going yeah and we would spend a little time balancing and placing his various percussion instruments into the image and what kind of verb you hear so again it wasn't like I wouldn't have known what to do with it, but I engaged these players beyond them being a session player. So Carl has played at that level of a, a great amount of influence on the songs that he's performed on. But there's one more person, and that is the person I began this project with. And it will sort of answer your prior question about how come it took so long or why not, in what way. Um, when uh, Journey was on the road in 2011, we brought uh, Night Ranger out as the opening act. And uh, uh, they had a new keyboard player. The original member had stepped away and they brought in a new guy that I was introduced to, uh, Eric Levy. Okay. And uh, I soon discovered on a night off when both bands and their staffs had a lounge in the hotel to ourselves uh, how talented and versatile. Um, Eric Levy is. He went over to a grand piano that was very lonely, lifted the <laughs> lid and began playing practically every jazz standard you can imagine. Wow. And I'm wait a minute. This guy is like, this is well beyond what he's doing here. He's got a great gig to date. It's been many years with Night Ranger and he has yeah. a play band and he has fans and People appreciate how he holds things together. But to listen to him play jazz standards, I'm going, who is this guy? So long story short, I, I brought him to a studio not far from where I am now and brought in Carl Parazzo and Walfredo. And we had the beginnings, uh, basic tracks for Wild Kingdom. And that's where it began. That's where I began with Eric and Carl as the percussion percussionist and advisor but eric and i have been working closely together on everything ever since that day wow wow it's that day. well came to appears first it happens to be uh the first song we worked on uh, the rest of the songs are not in chronological order according to when they were recorded but eric and i are musical soulmates uh he's been working with me for now for like uh more than 10 years, maybe 12 years. And I've been throwing at him uh, on not a regular basis, but off and on when we're in our creative space here upstairs with our rigs and, and the ability to capture or document the, uh, the, the event. Uh, I'll throw ideas, some complete, some incomplete. And those ideas may go by the wayside for months. And then I will you know, return to that idea. Eric remembers these things. Uh, he's got a great wow. set of ears. But even more importantly, uh, he's just sympathetic and inspired to react to almost immediately to whatever I play. That's kind of scary. It's like, whoa, <laughs> whoa. Like, I mean, he's honest. Like, okay, now what am I going to do? <laughs> okay. so, I mean, it's a good thing. So what I'm describing is a long, really tight and uh, symbiotic relationship with Eric as uh, not only as a co-writer, but... He helps with arrangements, but almost all the songs that are presented and with all of the big, all of the above begin with Eric and I. Wow, I mean, and and Wild Kingdom, uh, what an introduction to what you're doing here. Uh, just an amazing piece. Uh, so much, you know, the, there's African rhythm, there's Latin rhythm, there's you know, just all kinds of, and it's bright and it's it's. It's got a positive kind of vibe to it. It's just a 
glorious song to listen to. It's just, wow. Uh, you know, that was just a great intro. I put that on and I thought, wow, this is really something. And then yeah. it goes from there. Uh, you know, it goes to different places. Uh, it's crazy. It, it, it really is. Yeah, that, that song, uh, Glorious, uh, it, 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 it positive, inspired. Um, yeah. Some people ask, oh, why aren't there vocals on certain songs? So there could be, but I've had this vocal vision of Wild Kingdom. It does have this Afro-Cuban, but this Caribbean feeling, and, and it is a celebration of life. Yeah. People are lifting yeah. their hands to the heaven and celebrating how good life is, and it's positive, and it's happy, and by the way... <laughs> <laughs> we'll talk we'll talk probably more in depth about this but the music video by michael cotton for that song is pretty awesome i must admit that but but uh, i had this vocal vision for it which would be a choir of people singing the melody that's mm -hmm. expressed on my calliope keyboard you know it could be done in harmonies and I don't know what language it would be, but it would be something very a simple chant like that. Yeah. Glory to the great spirit. Glory yeah. to God. Yeah. Hallelujah. How, however you express it in whatever culture. But yeah, it's a yeah. very happy song. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it gave me a little bit, and this sounds weird, a little bit of like a Lion King. Uh, when you lifted your arms, I thought, wow, that's, you know, lifting the Simba care. You know, it has that kind of mood to it. Uh, it's it's very, very bright. Very bright. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's, celebration of life was a, was a great way of putting it. Yeah. And I'm sure as the second single release, uh, Prior to the album, I believe, it might have been a surprise to a lot of people. Tom Land was chosen as beginning piece because it's more broad style-wise and probably closest, it, it represents uh, uh, the, the closest to what I might be known for. It was sort of like the, uh, uh, not the equalizer, but the unifier kind of sign. This is a good place to start. And given how uh, certainly you and many people out there know how much variety there is in the album and how different it is from what I be, would be expected to present, the, the, big, the big moment was when we dropped the second single, Wild Kingdom. I go, okay, here we go. We're <laughs> dropping the bomb now. Let's see what <laughs> oh! <laughs> well, things have turned out well. As the uh, the third song, which is similar, it it's a, a I would say it's a Brazilian influenced song, windmill. But, but uh, then again, uh, uh, yet another bomb out of nowhere, and there's a great story behind Lowrider. What? Are you kidding? <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. You know, uh, there there was a time when we were recording. Uh, uh, just uh, prior to the lockdown, we were finishing the basics for uh, Incident at Nishapur. And that's one of those songs, uh, not unlike Lowrider, in which I actually had four or five people recording live. So it was more of a live basic. And we were also celebrating how we just finished Incident and how happy and exciting and energetic it was. And I said, you know, I've got another cover tune that might be. I've always wanted to do it. I think it's cool. I said, I like Lowrider. Everybody went, well, not so. Okay, so we did it. So um, cool. there's a great variety and difference in styles between the songs and the album. But Lowrider is even further out there. This is like approaching uh, what popular radio? Are you kidding right. me? Anyhow. Right. It was done on a whim, and it happened very quickly. And uh, as I mentioned before, different musicians for different songs is quite a long lineup. But uh, for this, I, I had I had done a gig with Gregorico from Sly and the Family Stone years ago. We went down to a nice blues club in San Jose and uh, played uh, in Lee Oscar's band. For oh wow! So I thought, gee. I'm doing a war song. Why not bring in Gregorico 
at the time he had been still living in the Bay Area. I think he might be in Calabria right now. I'm not sure. Okay. Desert, but again, a player that has been or had been local. I brought him in. I brought Les Stroud, who's better known on Discovery Channel as the Survivor Man, happened to be rolling through town. And so he did the, the harmonic, the harp parts on that. And I brought in uh, a Vernon Black, who was local. Wow. Killer, who also was on uh, uh, Incident Nishabor and Senior Blue. And of course, Mark Russo on multiple saxophone parts. We had yeah. a saxophone orchestra done all with one instrument. <laughs> and of course, TV. As always, Eric's always there. But you mentioned something uh, about, gee, this could be the Mark Russo and Friends album, right? It well, I, I should just once again deviate or tangent uh, to say, and I say this all the time, uh, Eric Levy is all over this album more than Mark is. Mark yeah. certainly sticks out because he's only doing solo work. Right. Eric. He is everywhere on this album, and I have no reservation in having said many times, yeah, this is Ross Valerie and Friends, but Eric, it's really Eric Levy and Friends. <laughs> if anybody's been given the stage, besides me, because I'm already there, uh, if anybody's been certainly welcome to share the stage and shine, it's uh, certainly Eric Levy and uh like you said, certainly Mark Russo. And, and that's just, you know, and that's, I love that, uh, you know, that, that sharing of this, you know, it has your name on it, uh, but there is just, you know, you recognize the talent you have around you and you're willing to share spotlight and let all that ego go to the garbage and do you know, music. It's about the music. Uh, it's about creating a wonderful, wonderful thing. And well, thank you, Scott. It, thank you, Scott. I'm, I'm so by that that uh, compliment. Yeah, well, there's so many musicians on all these different songs, and and uh, uh, it, it's huh. it, the meaning of all of the above, if I might say, certainly is the variety of music. Um. And secondarily, and this is not necessarily a, 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 a big push for me to present myself as a multi-instrumentalist. Uh, to me, it's like these songs either have had these instruments on them or they deserve them. But this is, all of the above could mean I'm playing different things, but that's sort of secondary. But uh, the main meaning of this is my genre is no genre. Pick a card, yep. anything, yeah. So, and, and so, in terms of multi instrumentalism, uh, there are two songs in which I'm playing two basses, a supporting bass uh, on uh, Night Flower, and a supporting bass on No One Wins the War, and Fretless, which nobody has heard me record before. Hi, that's cool. Yeah. I heard um, that, and I and and you play guitar on Windmill, yeah. right? Yeah, well, the best way to encapsulate this, there, there are uh, uh, five songs and there are four guitarists. We have Miles Sean, son of Neil Sean on Tomland. We have George Tickner, original guitarist and composer with Journey from the Early Days on Nightflower. Then we have Vernon Black on Incident Nishabor and... Uh, low rider and then i play all the guitars on windmill now there's a meaning to that is there is uh, for some of these other songs i wrote windmill on guitar okay. um in fact the version we're hearing is really part two but i don't want to confuse anybody with titles right now but the original was written on a nylon acoustic guitar in a six eight time signature and it was a rolling finger picking romantic tune well you know there's nothing unromantic about a good Brazilian rhythm. You, of course. You know, <laughs> a little more sexy, but no less romantic. Um, and such is the case there. Um, there are uh, six, I think six tunes with 
seven tunes with six drummers. If I've got it, all the all the songs that have drums on them have different drummers. Prairie Prince on uh, Land. Steve Smith happened to be in town when long ago. Night Flower was recorded with George. So Steve on drums there. Uh, we have Figurico on Lowrider. We have Celso Alberti, who is a Brazilian drummer that happens to be local. He played on Windmill. Uh, we have Paul Spina on Incident in Nishabor and Senor Blue. Who am I missing? <laughs> Anyhow, and then uh, amazing. Yeah. So there's a meaning to why the guitars. Well, I wrote the song uh, Windmill on guitar, so I went forward and played all the guitars. No matter, uh, <laughs> despite the fact I hadn't played guitar in a while, I had to work up sections by section to get it to get it down and so that's the meaning of playing guitar it's not oh i'm gonna play guitar no i wrote the song there so it made sense and the same with wild kingdom i wrote that on a dx7 yamaha keyboard with the calliope patch and had been jamming that song uh, across uh, decades and finally completed so that's the core of it Man. so in, in in the case of windmill and while uh and wild kingdom I recorded the basics with each of those instruments, keyboards and guitar. Uh, bass came last on both of those songs. And <laughs> in, in both cases, it's like I hadn't even thought about the bass. Of course, there, of course there will be bass. So for having played the song for my, these songs so much over the years on those instruments, when it came to bass, it pretty much fell out. So. I, I love that. I, and, you know, I saw that you played guitar and I was like, I was so, it was, it was so nice to hear you pl play, a, play a guitar, uh, yeah. you know, and, uh, you know, that's, for me, all of these things make it the Ross Valerie solo album. Uh, it, it is really your a statement um, of, of who you are as, as a player, as a person, as a, you know, a consummate musician uh to bring in all of these players and let them play uh you're not holding back uh you know this is a they like it, they like it. <laughs> yeah it was and that had to be a really satisfying thing too uh you write these pieces and you have these brilliant musicians come in and they appreciate what you're doing and that's that's really great and, and likewise uh, we were talking about you know carl Corazzo and eric levy but all these other fine musicians that have come into this studio under this roof. It's like, wow, yeah. these are the cats and I get to play with them. That's truly a yeah. honest, humble. It's like, oh, yeah. you mean I'm in charge? <laughs> <laughs> so, but it's all about composing and that's what people are getting to hear yeah. um, uh, as well as how they've been recorded and, how they feel and how they sound. It's it's about the composition and that relates to what's been piling up uh, on the back shelf and, or on the back burner for years. And some people have the impression, Scott, that, okay, this is his statement, that's it. No. But wait, there's more. <laughs> I like it. Lockdown diminished, I began immediately uh, developing more material. Um, my whole motivation it was to finally get around to finish what i started and this first album is certainly a good offering of having completed compositions that have been waiting well there's more that have been waiting uh that i'm continuing with and having a lot of fun with and if you want to call it a cover tune yes i'm covering yet again more artists uh and maybe in some ways it may be seen as or heard as abstract oh, oh look at that i already i would like to think that the music that i presented so far is a really big spread big horizon yeah. you never know what you're going to hear next well um i've got more for the next batch which will come out subsequently so um, I'm warning everybody now the horizon, horizon, the horizon, the horizon <laughs> will get even broader and uh, to wow. stick with me. And I'm sure there's some people that don't care for this song or that song, whatever. There's, I think there's something for everybody there. Um, I think and, so too. 
Yeah. I'm going to continue to experiment and enjoying uh, what I'm doing really for the first time in a long time as a writer yeah. and a painter yeah. and an impressionist. Man, that's awesome. Uh, tell me, is there a, a, anyone that you asked and and they didn't want to be part of the album? No. Any refusals? No. No. It was uh, w the advantage I had, and this is over several years, I had the advantage of being in the right city where there is such a broad mix of musicians yeah. who are known and great players. And many of them uh, ha still live here. A few have moved away. Wally Walfredo moved to Cincinnati to be with the love of his life. Beautiful. And uh, I think, you know, uh, Gregor Rico is like, like might be in Calabria. He bought some property there. So, But otherwise, all of these people are or have been in the local area. And it was a matter of timing when they're off the road when they got free time to do some sessions um you know this is not like an album that you write and arrange and you book the studio and block out two two weeks or two months this is a matter of years uh, uh only by its natural course of things this this is the way things developed i can't say that w what you're hearing in all of the above was that's i mapped it out i just continued to write and complete and arrange and, and and to answer your question, I fortunately had the availability of many local great players, and no, nobody refused me. That's it, awesome. Sometimes one of the people, Carl, goes, you know, I, I I'm getting back from Santana, but I've got these other uh, salsa gigs to do, but uh, mm -hmm. I've got another break, maybe two weeks, and you know, um, what did Orson Welles say in that commercial? No fine wine before it's time. Yes. <laughs> and yes, this is uh, over you know many years, and we get a fine wine for sure. Uh, I want to ask you about Tomland. Uh, a couple questions. Um, the title, Tomland, uh, what's the inspiration behind that? Well, I must admit that uh, the, the, the title and how it may relate to the music and then the music video by Michael Cotton it can be a little mysterious and it's like a little vague. Tom Land is written in memory of Tom Size. Uh, I'm in I'm in an area uh, in the East Bay, San Francisco, San Francisco East Bay, and I've always had a studio of any level of, of development, and usually had it in the vicinity of Tom Size, uh, my dearly departed friend, mentor, and uh, recording engineer and uh uh tomland was the name of his production company beautiful beautiful so, um uh, Precious. it's just a dedication to him and, and i think if there's a lyrical meaning to the song you could say that there are two people having the conversation uh, the, the, and the, the meat of the verse and the b sections is wondering wandering maybe questioning life to a certain extent. And the more powerful the parts of, of the song is the other person responding with resolution. Here's the answer. This is definite and this has meaning and power. So that's again, a little vague, but somewhere in there is uh, uh, missing Tom and uh, honoring him and uh, seeing him in the big sky man what a, what a great way to honor a friend uh just a beautiful beautiful song uh and miles on on the uh, on that song uh an amazing solo um you know and and we know we all know the whole thing with you know that you've you and neil have had your issues and and all of that in the past uh you know this is his son on the record playing his ass off uh just yeah. I mean, just crazy. Uh, wow. You know, how, do, how does that happen? And, and what's your relationship like with Neil now? Well, Neil and, and, and I and, and Jonathan, we parted ways about three years ago. So right. I can't say there's a relationship. You know, we, we had some differences mm -hmm. and we very quickly reached what the, 
technically a mediated settlement. We ironed out our problems, uh, agreed to settle, and now we've all moved on with our life. Good. But uh, in the meantime, the recording with Miles was done in 2016 when he lived in the Bay Area. He's been in Los Angeles for the most part uh, for several years. So some of these talented people have moved away, but I know where to find them. Yeah. <laughs> Relating, though, to the, I mentioned the video for Tom Land, and I mentioned, of course, Prairie Prince on drums. I should point out, if, if anyone is not aware of the fact that Prairie is a consummate artist, and yeah. he has provided all the artwork to date. Uh, on you would uh, see, however small the thumbnail is, album artwork by Prairie Prince that I collaborated with him on, and he's also done the artwork for the title, the still, the still part of the beginning of every uh, video. He developed, he did all the lettering and the design of the title cards for my four videos. Man. I should go further to say that one of his oldest friends and partner in art. Michael Cotton. Uh, uh, they worked together for years in developing the the visual imagery for the tubes, costume set designs, and of course Michael actually played synthesizer with the tubes as well. Yeah, I was two original or, two original members of the tubes. Yeah, in my search for videography and animation and anything but performance oriented videos, I wanted to do something very creative that related visually to the song. I was very fortunate to have reached Michael Cotton and he's provided to date what uh, people will see on my YouTube channel, mm -hmm. which are four music videos. Uh, Tom Land first, Wild Kingdom. I think that's pretty special. Uh, Windmill, a very exotic Brazilian feel and Lowrider, if people don't know, on like the it. summer solstice, which was the 20th, uh, the video for Lowrider dropped onto YouTube. It is pretty awesome. <laughs> I know involved with this, but there's a, <laughs> there's a part of me that can step back and go, oh, my God. Yeah. Anyhow, if it, people are wondering where they can hear uh, the songs or the album or how they could see the, 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 the videos on my YouTube channel, it's very simple rossvalerie.com yes. one word valerie.com and there you will find all the links to spotify amazon apple and youtube uh, enjoy yourselves and as i've said on many occasions um, either in print or in interviews the best way to listen to the album is first of all download or stream the whole thing wind up the cat throw out the clock <laughs> your favorite headphones or your favorite sound system turn off your phone and allow yourself yourself about 44 minutes you know to close your eyes or turn off the lights and Absolutely. listen to the whole thing as an adventure it kind of works it that's, definitely that, does that's recommended recommended listening protocol yes Yes, and, and back in the day, you know, buying a record was an event. It was something you took time out of your day to do. Uh, and I think this record deserves that. I think, you know, that is, like you say, that is the way to really, really get into this record and enjoy it the way it was meant to be. Uh, just, it, it is an adventure, for sure. It's, like, it's sort of like the old days, Scott. You know, <laughs> put on an album. Well, it's a very vague term these days, but anyhow, <laughs> yeah. some people think that this is my full statement, and I'll just say again, no, there's more to come. Stay tuned. And uh, Michael Great. Cott has, is in the process of finishing uh, uh, the videos for the remaining songs. So videos will be released through this uh, through the season. So and then there's more after that, Scott. Man, that is so cool. And and you, you mentioned Prairie Prince. Uh, a big part of your life story, almost, really. Uh, he did the demo, oh, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. For the first Journey record. Uh, yeah. You know, you have Mouthman with him. Well, how can we forget that? Can't forget Mouthman. And Mouthman's I mean, still lives. Mouthman has got some good prospects. 
and of course Prairie helping with the design of the original prototypes and like you mentioned Prairie being uh, at he was the first drummer with Journey yeah. prior to our our uh, CBS contract and prior to Ainsley Dunbar having mm -hmm. joined the band. so yeah Prairie and I go back years um, yeah. I should mention that um, uh, a great project that I'm very proud of having been involved with was when through Prairie Todd Rundgren invited me to join his live recording project. It, it was, it's called Second Wind and it is available. Um, we recorded, uh, Todd had a veritable orchestra of which I was a part and we recorded live for five nights at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco. And he released what I think is one of his finest albums. Yes, I was involved, but part of me can step aside and say, it's a, a, an amazing record and people should look for it and listen to it. Awesome. Yeah, we'll have links to all this too. Uh, you know, all the videos and, and you know, Scott, dude. Band and everything else. <laughs> well, thanks so much, Scott. Yeah, uh, I, I have to ask you about Touched um, on the record. Uh, you know, slower bass driven track. Um, yeah. You know, and and is it, that's a fretless, right? I mean, it sounds fretless, uh, but there is there is like a sub. It's not. Wow, that is amazing. Uh, but there, the the subtitle to it uh, is what really is intriguing to me. It's part, uh, which is L I, uh, which I'm thinking is fifty one <laughs> in Roman Roman numeral two. It's touched part two. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, why part two? Well, there you go. There's two stories behind that. Um, part two. Well, well, part one is yet to be recorded, but it is in the works. And it is similar to Wild Kingdom. Fast tempo, driving. It's, I would either call it a samba or a tamba, according to Carl. Uh, Parazzo. Um, it's very powerful. Um, I think it would be similar to Latin rock, something well influenced by Santana. That is still in the works. But what happened with Touched Part 2 is very interesting. I was upstairs here in the playroom section of the building, and I, I was over next to my bass rig, and I was experimenting with this, like, variation on touched and eric was in the room because we were kind of working on parts and creating experimenting he uh I, I was started playing these 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 uh finger pick lines on a four string charvel okay? okay and it was really edgy and gritty and it not only was I kind of uncertain how when I was playing it, there was tension and it just had this like raw sound to it. Eric pushed the record button. So with the gear we had upstairs at time to record with, he hit the button. It's like it is what it is. I'm gonna capture that. Wow. And and afterwards like, oh man, oh whoa, okay. And then the the, the time went on and and I and he put it up for me to listen to, you know, and we kind of looped it so I could listen to it continually. And I had my back turned to him and I was experimenting with these like guitar lines again on the same instrument, standard tuning four string Charvel. And again, it was really raw and it was not anything really refined about the way it was recorded, but you push the button again and there you go. <laughs> Um, given how it was recorded in such a primitive way might reflect in the way it sounds, but the sound is a part of the feeling. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Anyhow, no preface, it, that's just two, wow. bass, uh, written, uh, two bass parts recorded on the same standard instrument. Wow, yeah, I mean, I think that song, it's so different from all the others, really, but it adds Very. so much texture. I mean, there, it's it's just, it's part of that journey, that, that adventure uh, of the record where 
it gives you just a plateau uh to, to you know it's the valley in the peaks and valleys of of the record it's, it's just beautiful uh yeah. it works really well it Old move to put that out. I think it's like, oh, should I do this, man? This is so like tense and emotive and demanding. It's like, this is good. is this going to bum anybody out? Yeah. Ah, but if it, it adds to the the, the dynamics, is it, it is what it is. It's emotive and it and it says something. Yeah, it's yeah. It's different. It's not a happy tune. No, no, no. It's not. <laughs> but. Uh, in with you know but <laughs> I, I did so and and it's it's just ex, it's an example of of how i'm endeavoring just to be myself and not be concerned with what would the audience think well i'm just i hope they like it yeah if not that's okay you know my, my endeavor is this is not about a career it's just about sharing my music and being blessed with the ability to do so yeah, that's pretty oh wait there's more <laughs> and we love that we love that uh I, I do have one more journey question for you um you know you've Great. time is up uh, oh kidding. okay all right uh <laughs> i know we, i and i don't want to take up your whole day uh so but i this is uh this is such an honor thank you um mm -hmm. You know, Journey's seen many singers, uh, from Fleischman to Arnell. Um, but one guy in particular in there is he came and went, and it was so fast, and he's such a talent, such a great singer. Jeff Scott Soto. Um, what is there a story behind that, and why? There you is, but we may want to historically adjust the opening statement. Singers from Greg Raleigh. Yeah, 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 yeah. Lest we forget. Yes, Jeff Scott Soto is a fine singer and a great entertainer. He really is. Yeah. And uh, Steve uh, Jerry's voice completely failed on him. And on short notice, we had a tour to do. And Jeff stepped up and, and I did everything he could do to fill someone, uh, several other people's shoes on short notice, yeah. you know. A different, a different approach, a different approach to entertainment, a different kind of voice. But uh, I think he dealt, did as well as he could, and, and hats off. Um, yeah. uh, his stay with Journey was rather brief. When it came to um, uh, writing and, and, and arranging new material, uh, the writers, uh, Jeff and uh, uh, Neil and, and Jonathan and Jeff, it just Jeff's style was very different from what we had or have believed the journey signature vocal approach would be. So that just that just didn't work out. I've kept up yeah. with Jeff. So, um, yeah. There's a band that I go see every two or three years, a, a, a Trans Siberian Orchestra. Yes, amazing. Do the get sort of multicultural. Wow. Uh, religious specific uh, Christmas show every year. And Jeff has been with them for years. And he does a great job as a bass baritone. Can you imagine? He's he, really a bass baritone and he was doing Journey. That yeah. says yeah. something for like bringing it. Yeah. yeah. He is something special. He's been on the show. He, he practically has a cot in the room back here. <laughs> uh, he's done so much. And yeah. Then you than I do. Say hello. Uh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, uh, it was great to see him doing those things. Um, have you thought about writing all this down? Have you thought about uh, a, an autobiography, proper autobiography from birth to now? No, I haven't. You know, it it, it hasn't crossed my mind. That's there's got to be there's got to be so many stories, right? Well, there are, there yeah. are, but then again, there's a matter of confidentiality and privacy and consideration of other people's lives and 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 their endeavors you know yes. uh, just I, it's never crossed my mind to write a book yeah 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 I, I, I think interviews that accompany the music like this a great interview scott that shall suffice as semi-autobiographical yeah yeah well your music uh this record 
uh, all the above is is an autobiographical. It, it's, it it really is. It's it's it because it. I think it it. At least I feel you through this music. I feel this is what you're where you're at and what you want to be doing and what you want to share of yourself. It finally got around to doing something. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. Yep. Is, yep. Is, is there something else in your life? Uh, you know, a, a bucket list type of thing where, you know, something you've always wanted to do but haven't had a chance yet? Um, world travel. Yeah. Uh, my wife and I enjoy world travel. Uh, I must admit, we certainly have many places in common that we would like to see. Yeah. Uh, but I've got a bucket list for places I don't think my wife would be interested in. <laughs> Nepal. Uh, the pyramids, yeah. if they'll, let, they'll let me in there, but you know, things like that. But a bucket list, I, I think probably the primary overriding bucket list is to be finally doing what I'm doing now musically. Ah, that's awesome yeah. to hear. That is awesome to hear. Uh, I'd like awesome. to see a lot more of the United States rather than, <laughs> you know, I've yeah. known over. Uh, Grand Canyon probably a thousand times. Uh, <laughs> we like to see it on the ground. That's not to say I haven't seen some good sites, but there's some things like that that might be nice to see, which don't involve a lot of uh, travel. But yeah, you know, and I think there's a lot of people out there saying, "Here's with Journey for almost fifty years. The guy's seen every place on the planet. He's you don't you see know, it though, right?" A lot of think that Journey or I with Journey have been everywhere in the world. No, we haven't. We yeah. have it. I have yet to see Central or Eastern Europe. Wow. Um, yeah. But, see, but but when you you know when you're in the band and you're you, you get off get the plane, go. you go to the venue, you get back, and you're done. Uh, you yeah. don't re you're not ever really there, right? <laughs> it's rare. A lot of it, usually in in overseas travel, involves uh, asphalt, concrete. <laughs> Uh, transportation, uh, hotel, dressing room, sound check, performance, uh, and, and sometimes maybe a day or so to just adjust to the time zone. Uh, traditionally, the, the band at least had, when we went to Japan, when, and we did a lot, we did go to Japan quite often, we did get a little more time there to adjust and see a little more of the country, which I'm grateful for. I, You know, there you go, bucket list. I really, really like to go back to Japan and go out into the country. Wow, beautiful. Um, I just uh, took my wife to the UK. Uh, we just got back uh, last weekend, and we spent, you know, a better part of a week in London. There's a lot to see. There is. A lot of actually seen there before because you could, you can squeeze a little sightseeing into an afternoon. But I made sure that we went to the country in Hampshire afterwards. Mm -hmm. and saw the country and yeah. uh, the non-urban aspect. So same with Japan. I would like to see the countryside more than I have. Yeah, with, you know, where people actually live and, uh, you know, lead their lives, you know. There you go. Yeah, pretty cool. Ross, it has been a blessing to have you. Uh, so honored. Thank you so much. This has been great. Rub on, wipe off, and thanks so much, Scott. I agree. This has been a good, <clears throat> informative, and friendly interview. Uh, we know where to find each other, don't yeah. we? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Let's, uh, let's keep in touch, and, and anything you got, please, my door is always open to you. Great. Well, everyone, go to my website, rossvalley.com, and you'll find whatever you need to see or listen to. Yep. And that's enough of my uh, gratuitous promotion. <laughs> and I'll have more for you. Don't worry. Links to everything in the description. Uh, <laughs> check out everything that Laura Ross is involved in, please. Scott, you can stay. <laughs> Take care now. All right. You too. Thank you so much, Ross. Oh, boy. Bye.